Hello everyone. I'm going to tell you in a while, but I can give you a, a small uh, idea. We have 47 different locations, okay? Coming from Algeria, Austria, Bolivia, Brazil, Bulgaria, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Egypt, El Salvador, Estonia, France, Germany, Greece, Guatemala, India, Indonesia, Iraq, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Japan, Jordan, Korea, Malta, Mexico, New Zealand, Nicaragua, Norway, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, Portugal, Qatar, Dominican Republic, Russia, Serbia, Slovenia, South Africa, Spain, Saint Vincent, Turkey, UK, Uruguay, USA, and Venezuela. These are the 47 regions joining the meeting, so which is really, really, really global meeting, okay? We are on time, so <clears throat> we're gonna start. Have people uh, already texting? Well, welcome everyone to this unique female incontinence meeting that we have called Meet the Experts, Primum Non Nocere Secundum Curare. As I was saying, we have around 950 participants of this meeting, which is incredible, a record for a urogynecology meeting. And we are so glad to receive you here with these key notable speakers. It is a great honor for me to be here presenting Professor Peter Petros, Professor Paulo Palma, and PhD Dr. Emmanuel Delorme. Their names already say a lot in the urogynecology field. In fact, we were a uh, thinking on calling this meeting as Meet the Legends because we consider them as being notable, renowned speakers. And by saying their names, we all know what we're talking about. All of them, in a way, have pushed the borders, have a research for a, the new frontier in patient care, improving the efficiency and trying to bring safer devices and concepts. This is why for me it's again a great honor in the name of Promedon to present. Professor Peter Petros, he is the Honorary Professor of Medicine at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. And he's the creator of the Integral Theory and one of the creators of the TVT concepts. Second, Professor Paulo Palma, Honorary Professor of Urology at the University of Campinas, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And he's been him the creator of the mini sling concept and of era in the case of Promeron. And third, PhD Dr. Emmanuel Delorme, urologist at the hospital Saint Mary Lyon, France. All of, all of us know him by being the creator of the TOT procedure technique quite globally used these days. So being an honor, as I said, and before entering the, the official presentation, a small dynamic comment, you will find at the bottom of the screen some Q&A bottom from where we're gonna get all the questions. And at the end of the presentation, uh, we're gonna try to find three or four of them and ask the presenters their opinion and their discussion. So for me, Welcome, and thank you, all of you, for joining this meeting. Professor Palma. Good day, I mean, because uh, we have different times in, uh, around the world. Uh, thank you, uh, Alejandro. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor for me to, to be here. The introduction and overview I'd like to share with all of you today it's uh, about uh, me, about concepts. And uh, that's a, a really important uh, issue 
for allow us for understanding what you are doing. So I'd like to start with a, uh, a question. How urinary incontinence was managed in the past? So let's get back to 1908, as uh, Dr. Fraga likes to say. At that time, the Olympic Games in London, 1908, there was no differential diagnosis between stress urinary incontinence or urge incontinence or mixed incontinence. All these uh, uh, situations were managed in the very same way. In the same year, 1908, in, the, in Paris, von Giordano presented for the first time his sling technique, a muscle upon an flap from the abdomen to the vagina to close the bladder neck. Well, this technique has lots of complications, was abundant and have uh, some modifications. What's the rational and serious or hypothesis regarding incontinence. We have the abdominal pressure transmission in harness 1961, Peter Petrus in the integral theory that talks about mainly damaged ligaments, the hammock concept, the lancet, the facial lesion from 1994, and Bagstrom created the uh, urethral hanging hypothesis. So let's talk about that. The inhorny is a passive uh, concept for pressure transmission. So it believes that when the intra-abdominal urethra received the same amount of pressure, there was a continence. On the other hand, when this kind of transmission was not good enough, liquid occurs. It's a pressure equalization concept uh, the intra-abdominal uh, uh, urethra associated with a nice deal of vaginal flaccidity. It's a passive concept that do not take into account any anatomic detail. So taking the blood and neck as a sphincter, hypermobility in the shortening of intra-abdominal intra urethra the management is the blood and neck suspension to a high heteropubic position that is not anatomical, leading to anatomical distortion, bladder intellectual obstruction, voiding dysfunction, and recurrence. The integral theory takes into account mainly the uh, support elements of the urethra. Here's the urethra, the pubo urethral ligaments, the urethropelvic ligaments, and also uh, the vaginal wall. Here is the pubourethral ligament. This patient is leaking, and this is the simulated operation. When we uh, uh, do the simulation of the pubourethral plication, the patient becomes dry. And the same is true for the urethral pelvic ligament. We do a simulated operation, the patient coughs, and does not leak anymore. When we remove the, the clamp, she starts leaking again. So also the, the integral theory take into account the opening of bladder neck in the proximal urethra put these links not more in the bladder neck but in the mid urethra and allowing for the retropubic approach, the TOT, green and yellow, and the from, uh, only yellow from arc to another arc this is the meanest link. The hammock is this. The support the urethra is not a really a theory. In the normal patient, the urethra floats over this hammock. And when there is a damage of the hammock, as you can see here, the urethra tends to sink. This is from Mozambique, Vitor uh, Igor Vaz, uh, have this patient, you can see here, a tear of the hammock. The patient is leaking when you do some pressure and you correct the hammock, she stops leaking. 
the original hanging theory that should be a uh, more uh, uh, hypothesis is very similar to the integral theory. It's taking into account the tear of the uh, posterior tubo ligament. And one centimeter from the bladder neck is the GP, vaginal point. And this uh, scientist uh, advocates the, that we should put at the vaginal point these links because uh, it, it's natural and uh, you are allowed to treat even patients with no urethral hypermobility. So I take it, the words of uh, uh, Alejandro. It's a pleasure to me to be here with the two friends, but uh, two legends, Peter Petru, when he visit us, and here, Demand Delorme and myself, when we were in, in Sicily, in Palermo, with Gigi Gili performing surgeries together. So we are talking about quality of life, and incontinence is, uh, impairs quality of life. And uh, we, when we can restore the continents with no uh, complications, we transform the wet world in a wonderful world. Thank you. Thank you, well, Professor Palma. Now we're gonna go with Peter. Okay, good evening. And good evening from Sydney and uh, good morning to some of you. My lecture is understanding the mechanics of stress, of closure and stress urinary incontinence are, are the key to better surgical technique. So my, my uh, lecture is a general lecture on anatomy. And now, a little bit of history, how it all started. I had read Robert Zacharin's uh, work. Robert Zacharin did some beautiful anatomical work and described the pubic ligament, but he didn't know what its role was. Uh, around about 1986, I formed a hypothesis that the problem was collagen defect in the pubourethal ligaments. If you look here, you'll see the pubourethal ligament inserts into the urethra and the vagina. And that if you haven't got any collagen, collagen is a structural component of the body. If there's no collagen or defect of collagen in the ligament, if you put pressure on it, it'll come down. And you can see here... Um, what happens? I thought, well, okay, if that's how it works, if I put a hemostat here, it should stop the urine. So there it is. And she's coughing, you can see it coughing, no urine leak. And all I was doing was putting a hemostat there and stopping it coming down. Now this is a transperineal ultrasound <clears throat> and at rest, uh, you can see the bladder, the urethra, the symphysis. You can see the anterior vaginal wall, the posterior vaginal wall. Okay, and there's the posterior bladder wall and the urethra. Now, what happens when somebody strains or coughs? I showed you that if the ligament is loose, then it can't hold things up. There's the symphysis. Right here is the pubourethral ligament. You can actually see it. And... Uh, when the patient strained, you could see that the, it's called funneling, the bladder neck opened up and the urine came out and the distal urethra was open as well. Look what happens to the anterior posterior vaginal wall. They're pulled downwards. You see that? Look at them, they're pulled down. Okay. Now, I showed you what happened with the, um, when I put the, I think with, Ivan, you're blocking my screen. Could I put you off a bit? Hold on. Here. Uh, can anybody see this? There, there should be an arrow here. Can anybody see a white arrow? It's being blocked by all these no, people. No, no, we, we are seeing nicely. Yes, yes, we can see it. You can see the white arrow. Yes. What the white yes. arrow does is... Yes. It, exactly as the same as a hemostat, it, it restores, it stops the pubourethal ligament lengthening and it restores the distal and proximal closure mechanisms. You can see the bladder neck is closed, that's a yellow circle, and it's also closed distally. All right, now here's a video 
uh, again, and you'll see the three directional forces. That's, that was the first major discovery of integral theory. If you want to understand integral theory, you've got to understand there are three directional forces, forwards, backwards, downwards. Now, again, here is the symphysis. There's a pubourethal ligament here. You can actually see it here. And here's the bladder neck. Here is the levator plate. There's the anus. Now, the it's first thing you're going to see... ...sound demonstrates the three opposite directional forces which act to close the distal urethra and the bladder neck. The first force is activated by pubococcygeus muscle pulling the suburethral forwards, forwards to close forwards. the distal urethra. The second force is backwards. backwards. It is the levator plate stretching the bladder base back in preparation for the downward rotation which closes bladder neck. This is activated by the downward acting conjoint longitudinal muscle of the anus. And watch this. The levator plate down, goes down. The anterior part of levator plate. Down. To Look. rotate and close bladder neck. All right. So now this is very important because those are, I hope you will start reading integral theory system because those three muscle forces explain everything. Tethered vagina, urging continence, everything. So understand that the first really important discovery was the three opposite muscle forces acting against the pubourethral ligament anteriorly and the uterostable posteriorly. Now, some anatomy. It's not quite as simple as the pubourethral ligament. So we've got the symphysis here, pubourethral going into the mid-urethra and the vagina. Now, there's a pubovocycle ligament here that was described by Engelmann Sundberg, and it inserts into the anterior wall of the bladder in the arc of Gilvenay. It's a thickening. And when the first thing that happens is the forward muscle stiffens all this, right? Forward, then the backward stretches it, and then the rotation, this downward force, rotates it around the actually bladder neck. So the closure is a bladder neck and it rotated around the arc of Gilvenay. So the difference between the TOT and uh, retropubic is that the TOT goes horizontally here and the tape for the uh, retropubic actually follows the uh, pubourethral ligand perforates the pubovocycle. Okay, but both of them uh, restore the rotating and closure mechanism. Now, again, I showed you the what happens is if the ligament's loose, then when these muscles, when the patient coughs or strains, these muscles pull down and it goes from closed to open, right? From close to open. That's the extra distance. Now, what I'm going to show you next is very, very important. Um, up here, it's, it's a, a urine flow chart, okay? Pressure flow chart. There's a detrusive pressure here and the urethral uh, diameter here. Now, I'm going to talk to you about Poisson's law. Poisson's law states that the flow through a tube depends on the diameter of the tube. In other words, if the diameter is uh, smaller, then you, the resistance um, is exponential, inversely by the fourth power of the radius. Now, if you look here on the right, now, let's say, for instance, you are tightening a sling, right? And uh, the diameter is four millimeters. Just an extra half a four mil at, at this diameter, you need about 100 centimetres of water to push to get a flow rate of 50 mils per second. Now, just an extra half millimetre virtually doubles the force needed to drive the urine through this urethra. Now, think about it. When you're tightening, and you think an extra half millimetre is nothing. An extra half a millimetre is a lot. So, you, so the, the point I'm trying to make here is when I want you to think of this graph when you're tightening that sling, because every little half millimeter can cause obstruction or relative obstruction and increase the force of contraction needed to push through. Okay, so let's move on. Now, 
The second major discovery in 1990 was um, we thought, well, okay, we proved that it was loose pubic ligament. How do you make new collagen? Well, I worked with Professor Papadimitriou, who was the professor of pathology at the time, and we did 13 experimental animals. We implanted the tape, and the idea was to use the positive reaction to an implanted uh, material uh, in a positive way to create new collagen. Now, all of you know, if you get a splinter in your hand, it goes hard, you get collagen. So the idea was we put the tape in and uh, it creates new collagen. This is 13 weeks after implantation. That's a very substantial neoligament. So there's the vagina, the bladder. Um, the original idea was to take the tape out and we did, but we found that there was a, within three months, 50% of the incontinence had recurred. By then I'd started working with Ormston in 1990. We did six experimental um, operations and we realized we needed an implanted tape because if you take it out, it doesn't work. Okay, so I talked to you earlier about, at, and this is a retropubic sling, you all know about that. But well, let's come back to this pressure flow chart. Now, um, this is a 50 mils per second. And as I said before, um, if you put, a, uh, you need to, you need to tighten the ligaments efficiently so the closure muscles can close the urethra. Uh, so uh, let's go here again. Uh, it's about 100 centimetres of detrusive pressure for a four millimetre wide uh, diameter urethra. If you make that a little bit too tight, half a millimetre, you double the amount of force now, so in my experience, most doctors over tighten the sling, certainly at the beginning, and uh, they were even transecting it. And Emmanuel reported all the uh, uh, a wonderful compilation of uh, complications because people were doing it the wrong way. The sling is not to tighten the urethra. The sling is to is to strengthen the pubourethral ligament so that the muscles can close, so that the muscles can close the urethra in two places, distally and proximately. Now, Paolo talked about the hammock. That's very important. I'll be dealing with that right now. Now, here we are. There are two closure mechanisms. There's the bladder neck, which rotates around here, and there's the distal closure mechanism. And it's got, th it's got three components. Uh, here it's got the posterior puba urethral ligament. Here it's got the external ligament, and here is the hammock. And you see the wiggly arrow shows that the force of contraction of closure of the distal mechanism is weak. Um, and here again, now Paolo showed a very nice email, uh, a very nice uh, video, but here's mine. This goes back to about oh my goodness, I did this in about 1989, uh, a long time ago. But you can see here, if the patient's coughing and just tightening a little bit, just a little bit, it's still leaking and I'll put the mid urethral pressure in. So what I'm going to show you now is the, a technique. Now this technique, which I'm showing you, I recommend that you do it with every single mid urethral sling that you do. It doesn't matter if it's retropubic, TOT or mini sling, you need to repair the distal closure mechanism. Now, I'm coming back to this again. How do you know that the patient has got a deficiency? Well, firstly, you can see it, it's loose. But secondly, a lot of the patients will come to you and say, look, doctor, I don't, after you do a mid urethral sling, uh, about 5% will come back to you and say, look, it's terrific. I can play sport. I don't leak when I cough. But sometimes when I walk, I, I get a wet pants. It just leaks out. 
And it's like a bubble escaping, a bubble, like a bubble of air escaping from my urethra. And that's the, the urine leaking out. Because what does the distal mechanism do? The distal mechanism actually seals the urethra. It's the bladder neck that does the main closure because it's a kinking mechanism, it's like a hose, you kink the hose. And uh, all right, so uh, how do we fix it? Now, the external mechanism, external urethral uh, ligament, or Robert Zacharin called it the anterior pubourethral ligament, it's the same thing. So first thing you do, you take the incision to within half a centimeter of the urethra. That's important so you can access the external ligament. The external ligament is directly next to, this is next to the urethra. So you put a 2O vicral, a suture through there, a suture through the facial layer of the vagina on the left side, again on the right, and again here. Now you always do this with a catheter inside the urethra. Remember, the catheter is your friend. When you're doing mid-urethral slings, the catheter is your friend. So you leave the catheter there and just tie it fairly loosely, not too tight. And here it is again. Um, there, this is what we suture, this is what we do, and I'll show you a video of this. Now, this is from a, a TFS a mini sling, which is retropubic. And uh, uh, you will see here, I've That's I'm tightening, it we'll show you that in I'm a tightening the sling. But, it's but a, the tape has to sit exactly against now putting the suture into the external ligament on one side, into the fascia of the vagina, the subureethal vagina. And the fascia on the other side. And again, into the external ligament on the contralateral side. Now this brings together the loose external ligament and the loose fascia. And it really brings them together onto the tape. So the tape glues everything together. So we get a three point restoration. Now you'll we notice. replace the cut, the pubic ligament and tighten the external ligament and the subureethal vagina. Now you'll notice I took the incision up within half a centimetre of the, of the meatus. You saw that? You've got to do that, otherwise you can't access it. Now, I'm nearly finished. So what are the surgical steps for the best results and minimal postoperative retention? The catheter is your friend. You have an eight engaged catheter in the urethra for every step. I really recommend you use a non stretch tape because, you know, when you pull up an elastic tape, anything elastic has to restore. And postoperatively, within the first couple of hours, that elasticity will can actually uh, come up and close the urethra. It can narrow it now you don't solve the problem by doing it on a bare urethra and then sticking in uh, an eight an eight uh, an eight hagar because the hagar dilates the anterior urethral wall these constrictions is underneath so have the catheter in there while you're tightening or you can use a hagar if you want it's the same thing with a non-stretch tape you touch the urethra but you do not indent it. Um, you do a cystoscopy. Um, this is before you do the before you before you do the suture for the external uh, uh, closure mechanism. You do a cystoscopy. You have a look, and and then when you take the cystoscope out, you wait three or five seconds because don't forget you've stretched the urethra. It's got to come back down again. And then you can tap on the abdominal wall. Uh, but usually, if it's too loose, you don't have to tap on the wall, it just runs out. So when that happens, put in 
a Hager. An eight Hager is very good because you can take it in and out quickly or we put a catheter back in and then tighten. Remember, remember the, remember the, uh, the graph of urethral resistance, millimetre by millimetre. Don't go making a big tight, tiny bit, tiny bit, and then take it out and check, take it out and check. Uh, it'll, the urine loss will stop. You can press again on the abdomen or if you do it under spinal, get them to cough. And it's good to see a little bit of urine loss at the end. And the final slide is, what do you do if your patient can't pass urine for two or three days? Well, don't do what some stupid guys do and wait six months and, and, cath and with a catheter in and out all the time. Because by six months, the scar tissue is formed. And... The scar tissue, I mean, it, it is a problem uh, removing a tape uh, when it's too tight because it's actually constricting the urethra. And uh, it's easy to perforate the urethra when you're trying to do it surgically. My advice is uh, wait 48, if they haven't passed any urine at all for 48 hours or at least 72 hours, you know you're in trouble. Remember the graph. Don't forget that graph that I've shown you. I'll, come, I'll take you back to it. It's so important. At the end of this lecture, it's, we're nearly finished. Wait 48 hours. Now, in 48 and 72 hours, the scar tissue hasn't formed. It's very easy to just loosen it. Stitch it up, send it home. It's work. Now, let me take you back to that graph because it really is the most important part of this lecture. Here we are again. Now, again, this is... The detrusive pressure, here is the urethral diameter. Now, um, it does two things. Firstly, it explains stress incontinence because if the, pupa, if the, if the muscles can't close and the urethra is pulled open, at six millimetres diameter, you only need 20 centimetres of water, a very small cough to leak. In the converse, when you're tightening the sling, uh, at, at say at about four millimeters diameter, it, it'll leak. You need a hundred millimeters to leak. Uh, an extra half millimeter, you need 180. In other words, when you're tightening, every half a millimetre. The point of this graph is, I don't want you to take this literally, the point of the graph is that the urethral resistance is exponential. Uh, that if, the, if it's too loose, it'll lose urine at a low pressure. If it's too tight, they can't pass urine. Thank you very much. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Peter. And now we're gonna go with Emmanuel. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, or good night. It's possible now. Uh, many thanks to Promedon to invite uh, me for this uh, conference. It's great to be with uh, Peter Petros and Paolo Palma. I will present you how to decrease TOT complications. My philosophy about the TOT is, uh, is to do retropubic TOT. Retropubic TOT is a specific technique I developed since 2003 to decrease the complications, functional and anatomic complications of uh, TOT. If we look at uh, uh, publications and the bibliography, we see the subjective curate of TOT is approximately the same with uh, nine, 10 years follow-up for in all the uh, good publications. But if we look at the complications, it's very different. And if we compare the first publication on this table with Serati, and uh, the complications in the Cochran, uh, the complications are very different. And uh, we are very interested by pain complications because it is the more difficult complications we can have after TOT and groin pain are terrible. It's why I work a lot to decrease groin pain during after TOT. And uh, uh, if there are 
a lot of, if there is a lot of difference between the publication, probably it is because the technique is not the same in all the publication. When we do retro public tape, it's easier to do always the same technique. It's very safe. But when we do TOT, there are a lot of technique and any technique are dangerous. And if we look at this publication of Blaine, very interesting. Uh, it is a retrospective study of a lot of the department of uh, gynecology, and we can see 10 year follow up of uh, 60,000 patients. There is 4% complications, and the skill of the uh, surgeon is the base point to decrease the complications because in the court department, we, dec we, we see that decrease 40% of the complications. It's why I I think it's very important to work on the technique. Indications, sure, follow up, sure, but the technique must be perfect. And it seems me horizontal duty is one of the techniques to decrease visceral and functional complications. Uh, look on this pelvic bone with the bladder in green, we can see the urethra. And uh, the retropublic TOT described by Peter Petros, it is the reference, and we must have the same uh, support of the distal urethra between the last third and the middle third of the urethra. It is the aim of TOT surgery. And at the beginning, my first publication was very bad because you can see here, it was an oblique TOT and, uh, the, and the, the needle was too much on the middle of the obturator fossa, too big mistake that increased the risk of complication, functional and um, visceral complications. It's why definitively uh, this uh, uh, oblique TOT must be uh, forbidden. But when we do TOT with and helical needle, it's more difficult to do an horizontal TOT because the good way is not oblique, but horizontal. And with right needle is easier. And we can see here the uh, horizontal TOT or retropubic TOT with the finger inside the pelvis lateral to the urethra, respects the perineal membrane, and there is a very short way between the needle and the finger, and it is the right way to have the tape exactly on the same place than described Peter Petros for the retropubic uh, tape. We can see here uh, retropubic TOT. Uh, on the bone and an oblique TOT. And uh, this uh, oblique TOT is at the level of the bladder neck, bad level for tape, and the retropubic TOT is always in the good place. And the landmark of the TOT is not the skin, but the bone we will see after a different tape to have the good landmark and the good uh, uh, retropubic TOT. Here, it is the oblique TOT, bad technique, and the horizontal uh, TOT, better technique, to decrease the complications. Well, we come back to the, to the anatomy. The background of anatomy is the main uh, instructions to understand the surgery and to understand the TOT. That is the um, internal area of the obturator fossa. Here's the pubic bone, here's the obturator nerve. And now we will turn the model, okay? And it is the outside area of the obturator fossa, the pubic bone here. Here it is the two terminal branch of the obturator uh, nerve. The anterior branch, it is motor branch, and the posterior and internal branch. And this one is very important to know when we do TOT. And here it is the age of the pubic and the ischiopubic bone. With a tape here and a needle here from inside to outside. And what we can see, we can see firstly uh, we must be, when we do out in TOT, to be in contact against the bone, to be far away the 
um, this uh, posterior branch. There are 15 millimeters between the edge of the bone and this branch. It's very important to be in contact with the bone when we introduce uh, the uh, needle inside the pelvis is to protect. And when we do in our TOT, we increase the risk to have um, uh, groin pain after uh, surgery. That is the situations of to introduce the needle. It is the anatomic view and the surgical view. And we can see here on the anatomic view, the good point is in the corner between the pubic bone and the ischiopubic bone. Okay, and in surgical, sorry, and surgical uh, position of the patient's surgical view, we can see this point here and not there. Okay, there, is, there are three steps to introduce the needle. First step, the needle go on the bone and feel very well the bone and not inside the obturator fossa. Second step, the needle go outside and when the needle leaves the bone, immediately stops the way and turn inside to remain against the post, the bone behind the pubic bone. That's the great security to have uh, no injury, no visceral injury during TOT. These movies show well the different step on the bone. Firstly, the finger uh, look for the narrow um, in the, the narrow bone between the pubic bone and the ischiopubic bone. The needle follow the bone and when the needle leaves the bone, immediately the finger inside go up behind the pubic bone, protect the urethra and the needle go inside and there is less one centimeter to drain the tip of uh, um, uh, of the, the finger, and you can see the finger guide the uh, needle inside the incisions. And there is a lot of small anatomic tape during this way. Uh, and we can see on this anatomic view, it's uh, sagittal sections of the cadaver with the pubic bone here, the urethra, the blader, and uh, the finger lateral to the urethra, and uh, <coughs> we, we can see here the finger push the bladder neck and the urethra and protect it, and the way between the finger and the octuasa is very short at the end of this way. It's not a lateral way, it's a retropedic uh, way. And after the obturator fossa, the needle passes through the pineal membrane. And that is very important because that is a meatus, it is an interbook uh, picture, and we can see the pineal membrane. If the needle um, crosses the pineal membrane very posteriorly or very, uh, the, the, the tape will not be the good place. The needle must cross the pineal membrane just lateral to the meatus in between uh, the corner, um, in the corner between the pubic bone and uh, the urethra. That is very important to have the tape in a good place lateral to the urethra. The pineal membrane acts as a pulley to orient the tape in a good situation beyond the urethra. Uh, that is a summary of the different steps of the surgery. The way of the needle is horizontal, focus on or upper the urethral meatus. The needle gets a contact with the ischiopubic bone and go beyond the pubic bone to meet the finger introduced inside the incisions beyond the pubic bone, the finger protects the retra and guide the needle towards the vaginal incision through the pineal membrane in the corner between the last third of the urethra and the ischiopubic bone. Now we can see on these anatomic dissections, it's uh, 
um, a sagittal section with the pubic bone, the levator muscle, the perineal membrane, the um, perineal level uh, of the obturator fossa, and uh, the visceral level of the obturator fossa, the bladder, uh, uh, is here. And uh, we, you can see the horizontal way makes the needle exactly between the levator and perineal membrane in a good space, and the oblique way makes the needle upper the levator muscle is dangerous for the bladder. And uh, on this uh, uh, endoscopic dissection, we can see the oblique way and the horizontal or retropubic way. And on this uh, vaginal dissection, we can see the horizontal way and the oblique way. The retropubic TOT route is an horizontal way. Never we must uh, do uh, the oblique TOT because the oblique TOT increases the risk to have vaginal erosion lateral inside the lateral sulcus of the urethra. Because when we do retropubic, the way of the of the tape is very high lateral to the meatus and not uh, cross the sulcus of the urethra. Second, if we do oblique TOT, the tape will be at the level of uh, the uh, bladder neck and that is not a good place as Peter Petros described for the tape. We will have functional uh, complications and at the end if uh, we do oblique TOT, we increase the rings to have a, a tape inside the bladder. I think when we do TOT with retropubic, uh, the, the risk to have tape inside the bladder is very low. But between very low and absolutely zero complications, we can do fibroscopy. And when I teach TOT to my residents, I ask them to do cystoscopy. It's so easy to do cystoscopy. And at the end, I will present you my uh, publications about uh, transobturator route. And on these three publications, it's 2,364 QT route with zero surgical obturator nerve injury and just one growing pain. But this growing pain was not because um, it was not uh, injury of the internal branch of the obturator nerve, but it was because after surgery, the patient did an abscess and then come back for, uh, immediately for the follow-up. It would be uh, very good to remove immediately the tape. Um, and in conclusion, for me, retropubic TOT gave less uh, vaginal erosions, less voiding dysfunctions, no bladder erosions and decrease the risk of pain. The last point to have the tape in good place has Peter described because it's difficult to adjust the tape. In my experience, I use hallway uh, uh, hypoelastic non-stretch uh, tape, but every tape uh, is, is uh, it one adjustment and it can be different between the elasticity and uh, the grasping of the tape. It's why I think the best link is the tape we have experience. And if we change tape every time, we increase the risk to have a uh, bad adjustment after surgery. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Thank you so much for your presentation. I just want to uh, do a small reminder uh, for those who have some questions, please go to the bottom uh, where you will find the Q&A uh, bubble and there you can uh, write your answers. I will try to, to answer them at the end. Now uh, with Paulo showing us uh, the future trends or his visions for the future. And then we do the, the final round closing the meeting. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, well, that's a very interesting issue. What is ahead for 2030? Well, uh, let's start with the first uh, warning of FDA in October 2008. There was more than a thousand reports on the diverse effects of smash and slings. 
And at that time, the, the first recommendation of uh, FDA was training for pelvic surgeons. There was an impact, as you can see here, in 2010 and 11, 100% of the, the, the slings were synthetic. And then, uh, after the warnings, the uh, injectables came back in scene, and uh, in green here, the autologous uh, vaginal sling uh, uh, is coming back. But it was uh, last year, April 16, the F uh, FDA uh, uh, stops, prohibited the, the selling, the all industries to sell vaginal mesh. But uh, synthetic sling was not included. That's a very important issue. Only in a few countries, uh, the uh, synthetic sling is uh, suspended. But in, even though we have some impact in the sling as well. This really come back to the past. So the bladder neck theory was revisited. You can see here the Bursch, uh, Marshall Marchetti, needle suspension, and even anterior repairs. But primo non nocere, the driving force behind the sling evolution is the reduction of complications rate, as uh, Emmanuel pointed out very nicely. If you go to the uh, Cochrane and compare the uh, evidence-based outcome data from TVT versus TOT in a very high number of patients, you can see that uh, the success rate is about the same. There is no difference between them. But when it comes to obstruction, TVT, you have almost 20% of obstruction and only less than half, 8% of obstruction rate on this uh, uh, TOT. According to the integral theory, we have to reinforce the, 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 the loosened sling, the pubo urethral sling or the urethral pelvic ligament. So here we see again, here in red, the Retropubic, green and yellow, the TOT, and from one arc, tending to the another arc, the yellow, the main sling. As you can see, uh, Zachary studies this pulverizer uh, sling has a anterior portion and a posterior or retropubic portion. Is the symphysis pubis? Is the posterior part? And this is the anterior pubo ligament, and here is the urethra. When we have a, a collagen defect, the pubo defect elongates, and that makes that uh, the bladder neck goes moving away from the pubis, changing the angle. The angle is not the problem, have nothing to do with the continence. What we are seeing here is reflecting that this pubo ligament is loose. Another very important point, the villain. The villain is not the needle. The villain is the length of the blind step. That's why the retropubic TVT was adopted in our uh, center because the, the, the blind steps is only one and a half centimeter. That means safety. This is uh, the bladder. The bladder is the place because there is a huge hematoma, here is the, the sling, the retropubic sling. And this is a complication due to the blind step of the procedure. This is another hematoma, the TOT, the oblique TOT, produces a hematoma inside the aponeurosis of the gracilis muscle. And uh, the retropubic TOT, as you, uh, can remember the presentation of Emmanuel that not only a single case of gracilis hematoma and described. Regarding the mini sling, here is the obturator uh, uh, foramen, here is the obturator artery, and here is the ophelia mini sling. Here it's very safe; do not perforate. No possibility of growing pain or hematoma. 
Well, this is a very important concept. Uh, Peter addressed it very well is the how tight to adjust. You have not to indent mean sling, not to do different adjustments for any type of sling because you know a half a millimeter in adjustment may impact on the rotation. So the adjustment should be the same for all patients. You have not to tie too tight because you're going to have is this this one neck sinus. Uh, you can see here, the blood in the neck uh, uh, is up. There is a small cystocele, a retrocele, a small uh, uh, cystocele. And if you look laterally, this reminds us the blood in the neck of a swan. And this is pathognomonic of obstruction. If you find this, you don't need any other additional study to uh, make the diagnosis of uh, uh, blood outlet obstruction. So the art of adjustment, we uh, adopt now the eight by four, uh, eager dilator eight in the urethra and four between the, the urethra and the tape. This is a, a German technique from Colon. Professor Jager describes this is a very nice uh, uh, way to adjust and uh, extremely uh, reproducible because scissors are different but here we have always the same diameter in the urethra and between the urethra and the tape. Let me show you, this is a very nice study, it came from Bolivia, it's prospective randomized comparing eight by four versus scissors. It, just so, show, pay attention in the real operation. Zero when you use eight by four and 11 when you use the scissors, telling us that uh, the eight by four adjustment is very precise and reliable. When uh, we described the first single incision is sling in 1999, uh, we used uh, some uh, uh, biological products and even the SIS, and, uh, but uh, we have to, to dissect the white line and that uh, was not a very easy uh, surgery. So this evolved into uh, new devices like uh, many that are in the market. And uh, this uh, uh, meta-analysis published in the European Urology uh, comparing mini sling, single incision with the other slings, excluding uh, 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 TVT secure because of the, the uh, fixation system is very bad. All the other things, when you compare, have the same subjective and objective, uh, objective Q rate. Uh, this is our eight years follow up using the Ophiramine sling. And uh, the Q rate after eight years is 85% with 10% improvement in naive patients, 5% only of failures. But in patients with the previous failed procedure, we have half of these patients cured after eight years and 25 improved. And this is not a different from other tapes, other approach for previous failed procedure. Well, the comeback of the injectables. Uh, I think that's more of the same. Uh, we know from years, the indications for interurethral injections especially in the elderly and unfit patients, the true hypocontractility, and uh, uh, we need a well-supported ureter to get some coaptations. And how about the stem cells injection? It's not an alternative so far, because there is no innervation nor blood supply to these uh, stem cells. There is not a way to make it grow to the exact amount and, and to be functionally good. Uh, the clinical trials are disappointing. Maybe in the future, maybe a place for tissue engineering, but I don't think that stem cells is uh, of any is not the answer. Another important uh, issue here is lasers. When we uh, we hit the vaginal wall, and you you see here the urethra is well supported we can uh, increase the collagen contents and uh, may get some good results. The only 
study I'd like to show you is from Okui. He presented a uh, prospective randomized clinical trial comparing 50 patients in its arm, TVT, TOT, and lasers. When we uh, pay attention in one hour PET test, you see that TVT and TOT improved the same, but the laser was also effective. When we compare the questionnaire ICIQ USF, it's absolutely the same. But when we compare the uh, urgency questionnaire OAB short form, laser performed better than TVT and TOT. Uh, the conclusion of this paper published in the World Journal of Road last year is that laser may play an important role in management of it mild cases of urinary stress incontinence, although uh, it is still experimental and we do not have long-term follow-up. This is a cadaveric study, you see here the pulvoritral ligament, and here the insertion, here is the pulvoritral ligament of this uh, 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 meshless device with the spine and counter spine, that uh, the idea is to do uh, application of the posterior uh, or retropubic pulvoritral ligament. What would be the indications for this procedure? Retro hypermobility, previous failed slings as a rescue procedure, meshophobia, the unfit patient because it can be made on the local anesthesia in outpatient basis, and also as a, an alternative uh, to injectable. So in summary, the prevention of complications includes knowledge of anatomy, surgical technique, tension adjustment, and this is the art of tension adjustment, and surgeon's experience. So because evolution is forever, primo non nocere, but second curare. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paolo, for closing this lecture. And now we, I don't know, we have some questions. Maybe you, Paolo, could, could pick them and, and Yes, ask. yes, my, my pleasure, my pleasure. Okay. The first question from Gabriel Vallejos is for Dr. Petros. Professor Petros, if you perform the, you put the tape in and do the stress test, uh, but the patient is under anesthesia. How can you, uh, you think this is a reliable method? Um, is it reliable? It's reliable for me uh, because you see, if you don't have the muscles working, it's like an open drain and uh, I find that if the tape is too loose um, before, uh, and I do a cystoscopy and I take the cystoscope out and it's running out, if the urine is running out, it's like a drain. It means that the uh, muscles aren't working. And one of the good things that N. Horning did, if uh, N. Horning's thesis is very interesting to read because he showed that even under general anesthesia, the pelvic muscles were actually contracting. So, um, general anesthesia doesn't really knock out the pelvic muscles. The only thing that knocks them out is spinal. If you notice with spinal, they will defecate. But in general anesthesia, they don't. And N. Horning showed that. that the, um, so there, it, it shows that even under GA or epidural, the, the, um, or light spinal, uh, the muscles are still working. And it, to me, it's reliable. Other than that, you've got nothing. Okay. Okay. Uh, how reliable? I don't know. I mean, it's reliable for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move to Emmanuel. Uh, Dr. Rachel Raquel Lima, Professor Delorme, don't you think that the uh, pain complications are in the majority associated with the in out technique if we look at the publications and the different Cochrane, absolutely 
Now, it's exactly the same for uh, outside or in or in outside TOT. Look at the Abdel Fattah publications with the comparisons of the 300 case in one way and 300 case in other way. It's exactly the same percentage of complications. But if we look how was the technique, the how in complications where with no instruction really where you introduce the needle and probably the needle uh, was very often not against the bone. The needle must be uh, against the bone and uh, far away is uh, the vascular and nervous structure of the grain. And I think if I compare the result of a retropubic TOT out in with all the series I read in out, yes, absolutely, in these situations for me and my experience, retropubic TOT out in decrease the risk if we compare to in out to have groin pain. Thank you. Well, we have a lot of questions. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm sorry we are not in time. But uh, uh, Alejandro, if you allow me for two more questions. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Well, can I make a statement, please? It's very sure. important. Uh, look, we're never going to make progress for new techniques or improving the old if we do not understand how the bladder works, how the continence mechanism works. It's my experience that very few people who do the mid-urethral sling understand the mechanism of continence. That's all I want to say, that you have to study the anatomy and how the functional anatomy and how it works. Otherwise, every patient's different. Um, there's no such thing as a cookbook, but every patient's different. So you've got to understand the anatomy and how it applies to the individual. Thank you very much. That's what I want to say. Thanks, Peter. That's a very, very important comment. That's why uh, we discuss a little bit of uh, the theories involved in continence. And uh, uh, of course, if you don't know exactly what you are doing, uh, we can have a better result. There is a uh, uh, just a question from Russia. Uh, if there is concomitant cystocele and incontinence, you do one step or two steps approach, Peter? I do it all in one. About you, Emmanuel. Thing, yeah, the, I think thing. everybody does it. Uh, it's the no, same. No, no, I'll tell you why. The, uh, the important thing is, uh, it's actually a very good question. It, uh, it's very important when you do sister seal repair not to excise vagina. It's very important to conserve vagina because if you excise vagina and do a mid sling, yes, you can cause a lot of scarring and get problems. But if you, you can always do a sister seal native tissue without excising it, because all you do is tighten it and tighten the fascia underneath. It looks bad when you're finished, but within six weeks, it looks terrific. So uh, I think the takeaway message is do not excise vagina. You can do it without excision. And yes, I do both together. Always. I've never, ever done them separately. Thank you. One more question, as a, uh, I'm allowed to, from Carlos Diaz. Professor Peter Petrus, if I understood correctly, you are saying that we must put an extra suture at the end of the urethra in order to reinforce the continence mechanism at the exit of the urethra. Is that correct? It's, yes. I showed you there are two closure mechanisms. Uh, one of the discoveries in 1990 of the integral theory was that there were two closure mechanisms. The distal closure mechanism, which was closed by the pubococcygeus muscle, pushing the, uh, pushing the uh, vagina behind the urethra to close it. And the second one was like a kinking mechanism, you know, the, where it gets pulled back and kinks. And uh, uh, the distal closure mechanism it takes an extra two minutes uh it's easy to do all you have to remember is to in, 
uh, improve it is to take the incision to within half a centimeter of the meatus so that you can locate the external ligament and and always do it with a catheter inside yes i recommend that a routine whether you do two tot retropubic or even mini sling thank you peter uh i promise that is the last question alejandro but uh, no it's a challenging one i would love to continue until we answer all of them but it's uh, I, mean, I, I, I know you, time. Uh, the time mm -hmm. is running, but uh, Dr. Jaime Ruiz, uh, thank you uh, for describing your technique, Dr. Delorme. At what level do you read uh, it stays the tape when you do the retropubic TOT? And also, do you also recommend the distal procedure with Vicryl uh, as said by Dr. Petros? I can speak what about I have experience. Uh, first, firstly, I can speak about the level of the tape beyond the ureter. The, my, my, the, the aim of this technique is to put the tape where uh, the integral theory uh, explain us between the distal third and the middle third of the urethra. And with retropubic TOT, like that, we can do. But in one case, it's difficult. It is when there is no mobility, a fixed urethra beyond the pubic bone. And I think in these situations, it's a bad indication for all kinds of TOT technique. Second, about the distal uh, reconstructions of the, um, of the urethra, the external ligament, I have no enough experience to speak about. And I cannot speak uh, with this small experience about the results, the outcome of this point. Thank you. Uh, sorry. I, uh, I, there is very interesting question here, believe me, but... Uh, okay, let's uh, go with, with one more, Paulo, and I think we, we will need to do the oh, okay. summary. Okay, so from Dr. Rogério de Fraga, the question is, uh, Professor Delorme, uh, do you think that retropubic TOT is good for recurrent stress urinary incontinence in case of a previous failure of uh, the classic TOT? I think it's difficult to answer this question. The first thing is to evaluate why, where it was um, a recurrence of incontinence after the first surgery. And uh, it's dependent of uh, the uh, uh, pathogenesis of the, path the pathology, the anatomy pathology of the, of, of the, uh, of the bad, uh, result of the first surgery. And it's, if it is a good closer pressure, a good mobility of urethra, why not? If it is sphincteric deficiency, it's another problem. And in this case, like in the Korkan 2017, probably it's better to do retropubic tape if it is with hypermobility and sphincteric deficiency. Uh, because we, you, we can have 12% better outcomes than with TOT. But uh, if it is really a, a big sphincteric deficiency and a patient with a good shape, probably artificial sphincter is the best surgery we can propose to the patient. Thank you, Manuel. Back to you, Alejandro. Hey, um, okay. Thank you all well, for, this. for me, just to close the, this webinar, which has been awesome. Uh, it's been an honor, honor, as I said, for Promedon, in the name of Promedon, having you, the three of you, in, behind this space. Emmanuel, we know you were in vacation, so thank you so much for making a spot for us. Peter, they have been so late already there in Australia, but still answering the questions. And Paolo, as always, uh, supporting all of these initiatives that we want to bring uh, the new the science and have the experience available for everyone. So again, thank you so much. And finally, thank you for the Promedon team, the Brazilian team, Renata and Andresa for coming up with this idea. 
and the headquarters team with Ivan, Cecilia, and Lucia for making this possible. Uh, it's been a huge, huge pleasure, okay? And we're looking forward to see you maybe in a couple of months in another session of Meet the Experts or Meet the Legends for everyone, okay? Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.